All right, we are live with this very special edition of Dr. J Radio Live, where you could only hear it in this one place. As always, we bring the information to you, the people, uncensored and uncut. This is alternative media, folks. Remember, what you're going to see on mainstream media, you're not going to hear on this show. And just like you guys have asked, you, you wanted to speak to people who have been taken by extraterrestrials. You wanted to speak to people who have investigated it. And I brought you them, such as Yvonne Smith, Barbara Lamb, Dr. Jacobs, uh, especially Kathleen Martin, who's the niece of Betty Hill. Even Timothy Good, who rarely touches that subject, talked about that. But we have so much more for you guys to know when we bring bring on this fabulous guest who's not only a guest, an author, but I'm proud to say a friend. Uh, He is a MUFON investigator going on four years, and he is finishing up his fourth book. I have two in my hand, The Flaming Dragon, written by him and his wife. Uh, And I'm just giving you guys hints at the moment. You'll find out in a second. And Reflections of an Alien Abduction Investigator where the co-tag, I guess, whatever you want to call it, the uh, underwriting would be, it's real, and you should be worried, which I agree. If you put this in times in the line of the threat written by Dr. Jacobs, well, then maybe it is something we should worry about. Well, now, enough with the fanfare, folks. You already have gotten enough clues. Let's bring on our guest, who is Pete Elmore. Pete, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, you got two awesome books, one written by your wife that I said earlier. Her name is Barbara, who's currently writing her own book, but she also helps you a lot with uh, uh, the study of extraterrestrials. What got you going? I mean, what what was your primary reason for, you know, to look into this stuff where everyone would point uh, aliens as a tinfoil hat? Well, basically, about five years ago, I had an idea for a show. I'm also a screenwriter, and I've got some screenplays that are out there. And I had an idea for a show about alien abductions because I'd always been kind of fascinated about UFOs. And when I started reading about it, I read that even the UFO community didn't want to touch the alien abduction part of it. So I I was interested in that, and then I saw that Dr. Roger Lear was speaking at MUFON LA there in San Fernando Valley, and I went to go see him, and I got there before he was to talk, and I met him out in the parking lot, and I helped him with his equipment and talked to him for a while, and he got me very interested in it. I still, at the time, I was a little skeptical, um, but I had an open mind, and I watched his presentation, and he had actual hard physical evidence where he had removed implants out of people and had them examine the um, the implants at different laboratories all over the country, and it came back as being from a source that could not have been on Earth because of the radioisotopes in it. And after listening to him and talking to him and getting to know him, I really got interested in the subject, and that's when I joined MUFON after that and started investigating UFO sightings and alien abductions. I, I'm sure you know this. We've produced two documentaries with Dr. Roger Lear. Uh, bless his soul, he left us too early. I only wish he had some apprentices to carry on his legacy. According to uh, Sharon, his wife, he still only they still only have possession of one of the actual devices, whatever you want to call it, implant mm-hmm. that was tested. At, I don't recall the name of the laboratory, but you could find that all online. But nonetheless, he's a fascinating guy. He did 17 surgeries. But what got you to start thinking about who put these implants into these people? Well, once I went to that meeting and I saw him, I came back, and I have a fairly large network on the Internet, so I put out to all my friends, if anyone has had any experience with abductions, please let me know. And one of my friends from high school and even all the way back to elementary school contacted me. And this person told me, said, do you remember the UFO that we saw together? And it was the only UFO I'd ever seen in my life when I was about 17 years old. And I said, yeah, I remember it. And he said, well, I saw those ships all the time, and you're the only other person that's ever seen one, and I'm glad you remember it. And we started discussing it, and I found out he had been an abductee since he was about four years old. And I was like, why didn't you ever tell me that? 
And he said, because Pete, you were my friend. And I told my parents, and I got a whipping for it because they didn't believe me. I told a couple of other friends, and they thought I was crazy. He said, I didn't want you to think I was crazy. And I said, well, I know you're not. He was one of the smartest people I ever met. And once he told me that, I knew I had to believe him because this is a person that would never lie to me. And I knew he was a very intelligent, thoughtful person. So I immediately started diving into that subject more at that point. One of the great things when we were talking previous to the airwaves is what the capacity of, of alien abduction, what, what occurs to people, what they gain from it, and what these ETs can do. Uh, obviously, missing time is a huge topic. The screen memories, I always love that. One of the interviewees that we had for alien, uh, was it? Alien Abduction Diaries, that was the name of the documentary. We did one solely on the abduction, abductees and ab- their abductions. He was a 13-year-old boy, and he said that they came in as a Snow White, you know, to get to him to uh, have sex with, if you could believe that. Mm-hmm. And that was, was a way to extract, I guess, the semen from a young, pure ch- pure child, meaning a pure of alcohol, drugs, li- liquor, anything that would, uh, uh, diseases, that someone 20, 30 years older may have. But I thought that was a really crazy ability to be able to go into someone's head and change what they're looking at. Or what's worse, and I think this, you you agree with, tell me if you agree with this or not, that they have the ability to change themselves into whatever form they are, which means that, Therefore, they would have the ability to alter atoms, and to, to shape shift would be a really crazy scenario. Which of the two do you think it is, and if so, why would it be worse to shape shift? Well, what I've heard dealing with all these investigations I've done, a lot of people believe the reptilians are able to shape shift. But what I believe, a lot of the things you see on the internet would like say Miley Cyrus, they say, here's proof. Miley Cyrus is a reptilian, and they show the eyes. Yes. A lot of that. George Bush, even. George Bush, the queen, of course. The queen Uh of England is a popular one. Queen of England. Uh But I can tell you this. I don't know how much of that, some of that's fake on there. Some of it does look interesting. But I know that they have the ability to be able to change molecules because what they do when they abduct someone is they take them through a solid wall or through a closed window. You have to be able to manipulate molecules or the dimensional part of it to be able to get the person out of their own home. So they have to have that ability in some way. You know, I couldn't understand how a different dimension would work. So I saw this PBS documentary on string theory, which, if true, really makes sense. And it would just be layers over layers of alternate dimensions in reality but nonetheless to be able to as uh, Dr. Jalen Hynek put it that they have the ability to skip through the dimensions that's how they travel here and then to do so on earth like you said uh, Captain Robert Salas when when he was on the show about a year and a half ago I figured he was coming on to talk about Maelstrom so in the pre-show chat I was asking him, so we're going to go over this? He goes, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, anything else? No, he goes, you know, you'll find out. Well, sure enough, he dropped a bombshell. I couldn't believe it. You know, my mind was still trying to process that when he said him and his wife were abducted. And one of the abductions he remembers being lifted off the bed with no nobody carrying him, just uh, him and air between him and the bed, and then floating through the window, which he knew was closed because it had a certain latch, if something like that, mm-hmm. if that story's right. And so, and Jim Sparks is another person whose final realization that were abducted, that he was abducted, was a footprint of his walking with half through the mud, half inside. A glass door. How could that be even possible um, if it's a sealed window? I, I that just blew my mind as well. So, what do you think we're capable of that? Because I always think uh, y- you know this. People who come back from having abduction usually have more psychic abilities. There are people online who are, or in general in life, who are more psychic than others. There are online courses of learning photographic memory, which one of them is vouched by uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, for six men on the planet. And I spoke to him to 
to see if it was real. And he said, yes, so I enrolled in that. I haven't gone through it yet, but when you read other people's comments on it, it doesn't just go to photographic memory. It goes into uh, unlocking these other psychic abilities, such as telepathy and telekinesis and even speaking with things in other dimensions. Now, how would that be? Uh, in your explanation, how would you put it? Uh, and why is that such a devastating thing that someone can change what they are? And are humans capable of getting to this level? Well, about the humans getting to the level, uh, maybe we'll evolve that far one day. But I can tell you from what I have seen, that it is definitely the case that abductees or experiencers, as they prefer to be called, some of them, they do have increased psychic ability. Sometimes they had none at all before the event started having uh, happening. And then they'll suddenly start being able to read people's thoughts and they'll start anticipating things and seeing future visions. I can also tell you for certain that almost 100% of the cases, once things start happening with abductions and what they term as aliens, they suddenly have more paranormal activity around them. They can suddenly see ghosts or spirits. They can see things sort of phase in and out of reality, a lot of them. Uh, some even talk about time stopping in front of them. I even had one. Hey, now, yeah. explain that about time too. I don't want to. I want you to continue on the story, but after that, I want you to explain the concept of time because obviously, we make it uh, meaning that it's we have we put a certain amount of numbers and hours and all that. But yet, if other dimensions are higher, then wouldn't that not exist? So continue on the story of what they're able to do because that kind of blows me away of how an abductee can stop time or what was you said she well were? i've actually had abductees when i've done the investigation when they left where they were at and went on the ship some of them have the ability to remember being on the ship and they came back to their homes they actually saw themselves across the room where they were lying down or sitting and they got back before they were taken and I've had wow. this told so to they, me. And they witnessed their abduction, are you saying? They sort of did. They saw themselves, and then they were gone. And they, one of them, after it happened one time, it happened again. And they looked at the clock, and the clock was two minutes before they were taken. In Watchers 9, Rick Shaw did an amazing job of analyzing that video over the sea of Turkey, the sea over Murmura, if I'm not mistaken, right. how it's called, which mm -hmm. I believe to be some of the best video ever. Uh, Jaime Masson has given me well over 500 videos to use in the YouTube videos, and there's some a lot that everybody out there, you know, seeing, watching this, are not gonna are are gonna see over time because eh, there's too many files to dump in one uh, interview. Point being, as one of them was uh, that, and then of course Rick took it one step further. See, Jaime Masson always gets two other opinions. He has to speak to the photographer. That's number one. The second one is a laboratory that he goes to in Mexico. The third is he sends it off to a laboratory in Spain or Italy. Now, this one in particular was taken to the laboratory in Italy. Then when Rick Shaw looked at it closer and he saw how fast one of the figures was moving, he theorized that there is a time dilation that they're actually traveling faster in that ship or in that bubble of ship than is the rest of the world. Do you believe that? And, and how, if so, how do you think it's possible? Well, they have technologies and abilities. If this is I, this phenomenon is real, I, that's that much I can tell you. I can't tell you specifics about what an alien is doing, but I know it's real because I've talked to enough people and seen enough physical evidence myself. I believe that time is something they manipulate. That much I, I fully believe. I saw the video you're talking about, and I, I agree with Rick Shaw on it. I believe somehow time is being manipulated. But I think time really, once you delve into things like quantum physics and, and what our physicists are looking at today, I believe that time is something that will eventually be able to be manipulated by humans as well. Nassim Harriman has done a couple of interviews right here who's actually talked about solving the problem of gravity that Einstein's been working on and people didn't take him seriously until one of the heirs to the Procter & Gamble billion dollar corporation, multi-billion dollar corporation uh, came forward and decided to 
give be a, hum, a humanitarian, and that's Foster Gamble, who also came on the show. They both talk about the manipulation of gravity. Now, do you remember Bob Lazar, UFO Congress, 2014? Yes. So you remember what he said about gravity being the missing piece of evolution where we things that are science fiction in the morning are thrown out and becomes fact that afternoon. Things such as force fields, levitation, and manipulating time. Yeah. I, that blew my mind. So gravity does in, have something to do with time in that sense. Well, actually, earlier this week, there was an experiment where some physicists actually sent some individual photons you know, particles of light called photons, back in time a few seconds. So they actually really? did that. And I was reading that report earlier. So on the very smallest level, we actually were able to do that as humans. So it is something I believe as we're learning and we're growing that we will be able to manipulate. You've heard of Dr. Burrish's work, right? Yes, I think. Yeah. Burrish. And so his claim was that he was... Uh, he, of course, he was using telepathy to communicate with this extraterrestrial, but was supposed to be its medical doctor. I don't know what the title, but he worked at underground level in S4, having to wear some pressurized pressurized suit because I guess there were these. This being particularly came from was a different uh, setting wise. It wasn't, uh, you know, our percentage of. You know uh, what, what what our air is made up. It wasn't the same, and the pressure was different. So he had to wear a suit. Now he said that this being was not a be another being, but actually us, fifty four thousand years in the future. Now, as you know, there's been a split in the Rendlesham Forest uh, ties, where one set believes it's extraterrestrial, the other set, being Peniston, says that it's time travelers because uh, it said year 83,000 or something like that. Do you think that we, that's what the little grays are, is what Dan Burrish expressed, or is that just an anomaly, meaning uh, he just got a hold of a gray, or S4 did, or the government did, whatever it was, uh, and also that what uh, Jim Penniston saw in 1980 was uh, more a time, a time machine as opposed to an extraterrestrial craft? Well, I believe that the Greys, they're, I, I don't believe the thing about they're from the future. And I'll tell you why. It's possible that this is all of the above. Um, you know, as above, it is below, uh, as, as some say. But I'll tell you this. The Greys, in the exact same form we see them today, there are wood carvings of them and stone carvings of them that go back thousands of years. However, thousands of years ago, they weren't called aliens because people didn't grow up then in the Star Wars generation or the Star Trek generation. They grew up believing in fairies. Now, these greys, which they've carved, have sort of bald heads, large heads, large eyes, hardly any nose or mouth, look exactly like what you see today. And what these fairies did, it's not your Disney Tinkerbell. These fairies would go abduct young girls, young teenage girls, from their homes, take them, they said, inside of a mountain, sometimes keep them up to a year. They would impregnate them. They would let the girl have the hybrid baby. They would keep the hybrid baby, and they would return the girl to her home. And it would be when they returned her as if time hadn't passed at the home, but it had passed a year's time in the girl's life. Now, that's very similar to the modern abduction scenario. So I believe this has been going on with humans for a long time. It's just your frame of reference. You know, if you're very heavily religious or Christian, you might think you just saw an angel. If you're an atheist, you'll say that's an alien because you've seen things like this on television and you've watched E.T. and everything. It just depends on what you grew up with and what your frame of reference is. But throughout history, as long as there have been people, there have been abductions and there have been these creatures that do it. Let me say a couple of things, uh, three things first, and then I'm going to see if the, leave the floor for, for you to see if you agree or not. I read a really interesting case of uh, cowboys, essentially, in the 1890s traveling west, 
and they came upon a train with no tracks. And they saw the pilot or the conductor, the engineer. They went up to the engineer and the end. Uh, he was not human, but they said he looked uh, like he was one of the Orientals, is how it, the reporter put it. And he said, oh, wow, what are you using? And the, the E.T. responded, we're using air brakes. And he says, why no tracks? He goes, oh, we're testing this for the future. This is how things will be. And he just, you know, took a believe the story and uh, started riding off his on his horse and by himself. And this thing ended up, uh, you know, gliding over the ground a little bit and taking off. Now, then you have the 50s and 60s where everyone was talking about the ETs. Uh, I, I don't remember the name of the person. You might remember something in California. Uh, Adamski, that's who it was, who kept saying that these things were Venusians, mm-hmm. right? So, so it's, you're right. It totally seems like they go through the times. You have the dwarves, the elves. Uh, 2,000 years ago, they were referred to as the angels. Ted Peters, great author and a Lutheran pastor who believes every encounter in the Bible is extraterrestrial. Now, we also have Bob Lazar who says we have had 63 external corrections. And one thing I def- absolutely agree with is things have been going on throughout time because there have been cave paintings dated to 38,000 years ago, long before humans can write, Homo sapiens, at least on this planet, can write. And yet, there are paintings of these flying saucers, one of them about 12 to 14,000, 12,000 BC or 14,000 years in general, of an astronaut with a, a helmet. I mean, how can they have known that or seen that or even imagined that? You know, imagination comes from what you see and what can do. You don't make things up such, such as that that wouldn't be even in your, in your head. Now, the final thing I'm going to tell you is what Linda Moulton Howe said a couple of interviews ago that blew everyone's mind away. Earth has been terraformed for the last 270 million years to create space for this current experiment of Homo sapiens. And that we, Homo sapiens, are, don't just live on Earth, we're seated on multiple planets. So there are Homo sapiens that may be coming from other galaxies or other star systems or in different stages of evolution, lower than ours, far better than ours, more peaceful, maybe more war, you know, tribe warfare that we used to be. What do you think about all these things, that, facts I told you that all the researchers are spitting out? Well, I agree with a lot of that. I agree with some of what uh, Linda Milton Howe said. I had the good fortune of talking to Michael Cremo, who wrote Forbidden Archaeology, Yes, And I agree with a lot of his findings. Um, there's a thing on the Internet right now. You can see where there's this hammer found in 65-million-year-old rock when it was broken open. There's been gold chains found in 100-million-year-old coal when it breaks open. There's lots of these anomalies. And modern science and modern historians, to me, are just as rigid as a religion. You can't have an anomaly that upsets their paradigm, because if you do, how do you make money as a scientist? You get government grants. That's how you can continue working. Well, if you say, well, I know there were modern humans here 65 million years ago because here's this hammer. We just got out of 65 million-year-old rock. Then the people above you say, no, that's impossible, and we're going to take your grant money away. What I have found out studying this over the years, because it's been a passion of mine, is there have been many, many advanced civilizations on Earth. They build up. There is a huge natural catastrophe, which deals with comets and the parts of the galaxy as we go through it in every uh, 26,000-year-old cycle. And a lot of times they rain down onto Earth, and it will exterminate up to 90% of the population. And then it takes tens of thousands of years to build back up, and then civilization will get to the point where we're at now, and you can fly, and you can maybe go into space, but then you're entering right now, and this is something your listeners can be aware of also, NASA has actually started talking about this, we're entering that area of space right now where it is possible for the big comet swarm to hit the Earth and cause an extinction-level event. 
our society is not immune just because we think we're so smart and we're so modern. We have nothing that can stop this from happening. And this has happened many times before. There's a lot of evidence supporting it. The last major time was 12,800 years ago when a comet swarm hit North America and formed what is called the Carolina Bays, which is shallow impact craters, all over North America and killed every mammal in North America larger than a field mouse. There's actually, really? Yes, there's actually tusks from the, um, the mastodons that live in, you know, if you saw Ice Age, the, the woolly mammoths. Yes. The, the tusk, and the way you find this out, the tusk, you can put a magnet to the tusk of these that, that died during that calamity then, and it will magnetically pull out minute pieces of iron because from what uh, a researcher named Mike Bell, who is extremely good at um, the comet impacts, he, he's written several books, and he's part of uh, what I use as my uh, bibliography in my books. He proved in his books that trillions and trillions of small pieces of iron rained down on North America, and they were embedded in these tusks, which survived from these woolly mammoths. And it basically came down so hard and so fast, it stripped the meat off of their bones and killed them. I want to actually know more about Ellie's extinction-level events. That, that was that famous Two movies, in fact, one right. by Disney, Armageddon, the other, Deep Impact. How many do you think we've had on this Earth? And second of all, most important of all, do you think some of them are man-made, meaning not man-made, ET-made, for them to wipe us off to create their new life? Because allegedly, some people say the Great Flood was solely to wipe off that certain race to create uh, what is now Homo sapiens. Well, that's one thing <clears throat> that I researched a lot before I did this book, is the Great Flood. I can tell you, uh, as we're talking about <clears throat> excuse me, extinction-level events, <clears throat> that with the comets hitting, there have been at least 24 in the last 16,000 years. And they seem to hit at certain times. Um, every That many? Yes. Really, that many? Yes, and... Um, some of, sometimes, so, did you say Tunguska was that one? Um, well, I, um, that was a very, very small one. Every time we pass through that area of space, we do not get hit with the huge hits, but we, we do get hit. Um, in 535 A.D., which was the setting for my book, The Flaming Dragon, we had parts of a comet that exploded over England, and it you know, a comet is different than a meteorite. A comet a lot of times will explode in midair. And it set the entire island of Britain on fire. It also threw so much dust up into the atmosphere that there was no summers worldwide for nine years. And they say at that yeah, point in time... would have wiped off anything, I would imagine. Right. In China, records from there show up that 90% of their population died. In England, they had to evacuate, or it wasn't England at that time, it was called Britain. They had to evacuate Britain. Most of Europe, the people that were mass migrations as they tried to find a place to go. But now you have to remember getting back to the Great Flood, which happened about 5,000 years ago. It was also a giant comet or a piece of one which hit in an ocean. And what happened was this was such a large event, it threw so much water into the atmosphere that it caused it to rain. Some sources are different, but the Bible, of course, says 40 days and 40 nights. Yes. But here's the thing. Well, well I, let, me, let me jump in with one quick thing. Mm -hmm. When I was in school and we went to Sunday school, as a very, very young child, because I was born into Greek Orthodox religion, which is the first Christian religion formed. Mm -hmm. It was formed just a, a couple of years, a few years after Christ died in 38 AD by Apostle Peter. We were taught that every time you see 40 in the Bible, it they didn't have the number 40 then, because I, they all they used 40 was to mean many. Right. <clears throat> and the interesting part there is when I was doing the research, I found there were over 54 different cultures 
that referenced the Great Flood, and they all had their legend and mythology about it. Now, here's the thing. Back then, when someone said the entire world was flooded, it's not the same thing as saying today the entire world was flooded. Back then, for a culture, it was, it could be horizon to horizon. They didn't know in North America what was happening in Asia. They knew their small part of North America was flooded. But these societies, these 47 societies, all survived, which means the entire world didn't flood, but they all said the same thing. They said that before the flood, they saw a bright star come into the sky, and it got closer and closer. And in that time, they would be referring to a comet as a bright new star. Now, I believe these mythologies at least all have a kernel of truth in it. And, you know, in China, in Europe, in South America, in India, they all talked about this great flood. Some of them found refuge in the mountains. Some of them have the same type of ark story as you have in the Bible with Noah and the ark. But this, according to the research that Mike Bell did, if you look back in the history of when we're going through these swarms, that was the exact time we went through the swarm that we were basically going to be going through in the next couple of hundred years. And we were not lucky then, and there was an impact. And probably about 85 to 90 percent of the world's population died then, just like it did in the 6th century when about 70 to 80 percent of the world's population died because of the comet hit then. It's much more common than modern science wants to think it is. Or if they do know, they're not wanting to tell the public. Well, what about the Black Plague? How does that fit in there? Because obviously they talk about the Black Plague decimating Europe. Well, the Black Plague does fit into it, and comets were known over history as harbingers of doom. And it was said that they would cause disease and pestilence. And a lot of researchers believe that the microbes that cause the, you know, the bacteria, the viruses, particularly viruses that cause things like the Black Death actually came in on comets. You know, NASA even says now comets probably were bringing the ingredients of life to the planet and started life on the planet. That's the scientific explanation. A lot of researchers believe they also, during those times, it, it's airborne viruses from the comets that entered the atmosphere that start the things like the Black Plague. Now, we know it does get passed from fleas from rodents. That much is true, but the fleas had to get it from somewhere, too. And there's a lot of researchers who believe it comes in on comets. Yeah, and that would make sense, and that would also fill what's missing in the, the theory of panspermia, you know, ha carrying uh, some sort of microbes, life, viruses, anything like that. If you have a comet that has uh, something like that landing on a uh, – decimating a, a, a planet of some sort and then having the ability to have that life sort of start to generate, then, you know, that, that would f fulfill the model that they've been talking about, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, I believe it would. I think it makes a lot of sense. And in the 6th century, some of the historians wrote that there was a pestilence going through the land in a yellow dust. And whenever people would breathe it in, they would become very sick and die. And I believe that you get all sorts of life coming in off of these comets. You know, the one right now where NASA has the, um, the probe on it has detected carbon on that comet. There's another one that recently they discovered was actually spewing alcohol really? off of the comet. And, you know, I thought you had to have something organic yes. to have alcohol. I mean, I'm not an authority on that. But that, to me, it just shows that there. I think there is a lot of life all over the universe. We are very arrogant as humans if we think we are the only life. I mean, to me, I think it's impossible looking at the number game out there. When when you and I were in school, of course we were taught we're the only life. There's no such thing. Aliens that don't exist are in your head. We were taught that nothing exists, uh, no planet exists outside of our solar system. Our solar system is the only one out there. The rest is just space, dust, and stars and comets 
flying around, meteors, showers, two meteors, but there was no planets. There was no such thing as an exoplanet. Well, everybody who is of kindergarten or, you know, or, or not kindergarten, who was a kindergarten then or even from birth, anybody who's 20, 18 and 22, you know, born to kindergarten, 18 and 23, I suppose, was born after the fact that Kepler discovered its first exoplanet and then went on to find Goldilocks planet after Goldilocks planet after Goldilocks planet to where not too long ago you found Earth's second cousin, they labeled it. And then we also found, according to what Michu Kaku says, the different types of civilizations, that they Kepler found an alleged higher advanced civilization, which would be categorized as a type 2 civilization. What do you think about that? Well, I, I agree with that. I'm familiar with Michio Kaku's work, and I know how he classifies, like, the most advanced one would be able to put a Dyson sphere around a sun or a, their, yeah. their star and be able to use the energy from it. I know I was reading now the most likely candidate close to us is a star in the Wolf system, which is in the Goldilocks zone and is only 12 light years away from Earth. And I think that possibly in our lifetimes, we're going to see that announcement one day that, you know, there it is. There is other life out there. It seems like we're being drip fed this over time. You're finding exactly. out more and more. Exactly. Now, here's one thing I, I read. Preston Dennett did a really good job on putting a full chapter on Edwards Air Force Base. Now, the stories of this Eisenhower ET medium been going on for a long time. And the story goes, as you know, he met with uh, twice, I guess, uh, to, couple of years apart, but the first one in 54, what was known as Muroc Air Force Field, uh, Air, Air Base, now at Edwards Air Force Base. And he was shown technology and powers that uh, really just, uh, you know, blew his mind. Apparently, he even took a ride to the cosmos. I have no idea where they took him. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have the eyes and brain of what uh, that man experienced? Nonetheless, he made a plan, allegedly, either first one of the letters written from somebody who was present at that meeting, sending it to a friend here in Cal in America from the UK, and that letter is published in Preston and its book. It talks about Eisenhower making a, a supposed announcement that May, I think this occurred in February, well, we never saw that announcement in 54. We never saw the announcement in 99. We never saw it in 2000, 2012. We keep getting to this hoping that POTUS is going to sit on the White House lawn and talk about it. But allegedly, Eisenhower was supposed to be putting a 50-year acclimation plan into effect. It sounds like we're getting you know, drip-fed, like you said, acclimated to this topic. But at the same time, you know, it seems to me that factions don't want us to have this at all. Why are 5,000 free energy patents suppressed if that's sort of type of what vehicles they use? Because They're suppressed because the people who have the money in this world and own the oil companies are the same people that for the last several hundred years have run things, and they're the ones running the world governments. They don't want us to not be dependent on petroleum products. They don't want us to have the free energy. And getting back to Eisenhower, I actually met and talked to Laura Eisenhower, which yes. is, is his granddaughter, I believe, and she confirmed, yes, that did happen with him. And she she's totally heard these things growing up. So those and, meetings did happen. And an exchange happened where he was allowed to abduct a certain number of humans, right, in exchange for uh, exchange for them for tech powers. And also one thing I heard. Now it, think about this: if you were in a general's position, but you weren't at the meeting, so therefore the aliens didn't pick, pick up on your telepathy or your thoughts. And you're a general, and you're saying, okay, our president is meeting with these beings who can come and go into our airspace, have technology that could decimate the heck out of us. Wouldn't you think like a general and start forming a way to take them down? I would, but maybe they were so far above us in technology, they thought it was useless. I can tell you this, the most credible UFO sighting that I know of here in Southern California happened right above a freeway, and the person who saw it 
saw the flying saucer, which looked kind of like a classic 1960s picture you would see of one, fade in and fade out. It would be solid as it could be, and then it would fade out. Like it was just kind of like going in another dimension. Yes, exactly. And I can tell you about disclosure. That's not going to come from the government. Disclosure is going to come from the people who know that aliens exist, and there are the abductees and the experiencers. They are the ones who have to be able to stand up and say, I'm not crazy. This happened. It's the same thing. Let me ask you this. I've been, I, every, every program I do, I say to everyone out there, disclosure is in your hands. It's mm-hmm. everybody's r- responsibility. It's not going to be a handful of researchers and journalists talking about the subject. You need more than that. Everybody can, has some sort of skill. You can either speak a foreign language. You could, uh, you're good with tools. Whatever it is, use your skills and master communication skills and come forward. Be active. Don't be proact- uh, passive. Become proactive when it comes to this topic. Why is it that we can't get 1,000 people, let alone a million people like Martin Luther King did, to have a real march uh, over to Area 51 crossing their lines? Are they going to kill 1,000 or 10,000 or hopefully a million people? No, they couldn't. That'd be genocide. Or would they do the same thing if we all did slept outside of you know, the White House gates demanding this. Sure, they could come arrest us, but go to jail, come back out, do the same thing. You know, I I was disappointed when I was watching the Occupy LA movement disband just because they were all being given tickets and arrested. I mean, that's that's a way to go for for your rights, guys. You know what I mean? And what's it going to take, Pete? Well, the people have to get over their fear. Because I understand their fear. I've talked to many people who have lost their jobs if they let it be known that they were abducted or they believed in aliens. I've because even, we've been indoctrinated that they're crazy. Yeah, and even their spouses in some cases leave them over it. I've had that. I've heard that sad story more than once. But it still has to come from this group of people. After I wrote this book and I put it up on Amazon for sale. I started having people all over the world buying it, and they started messaging me on Facebook or emailing me, and they were pleading with me to listen to their stories, and I've had to take a lot of time and listen. And that's all these people want is someone not thinking they're crazy. They just want someone to listen to them and believe what they have to say. A fact is something that you experience yourself. It's not your opinion that aliens exist. It's a fact if it happened to you. And – I know you know very well Yvonne Smith, the head and founder of Zero International, and I've talked to her about this. We would like to one day hold the first national convention for disclosure featuring a lot of experiencers and abductees, and we would like to – we're working on now that to figure out how to do it. I think we have to do something like that. We have to treat this as a civil rights movement. I mean, I even know a guy who was high up in Hollywood, and when his producers found out that he thought he was abducted, he got fired. They didn't care about anything else. We don't want you anymore. It's something we have to change public opinion. And in this day and age where we got Donald Trump running and Hillary Clinton running and how crazy it is, you know, you you can't say a wrong thing about any religion or it's hate speech. What about these people? If one person stands up and honestly says, I was abducted, they're treated very, very poorly and treated like an outcast. It's just something we have to bring before people. We have to bring it before the nation and the world, and we have to put it out there. If you had all the resources, if you had you know, all the money in the world, all the planes in the world to get people to one place, what can you do? Uh, Tony Robbins, let me give you a little story on this. My, uh, I got a media pass and went to his last event. Found out that the minimum ticket was between eight hundred and eleven hundred dollars. The maximum ticket was twenty five grand. So knowing be- because I used to produce large scale events, uh, the most highest was over ten thousand people in two thousand. Knowing what that LA Convention Center costs to rent, because I've inquired, I was about going to do an event there, and calculating the thoughts of the the, the the prices in my head of, of you know of all those costs, 
I came to the conclusion of he couldn't have cost more than two, maybe three million. I mean, that's a big plus or minus, you know, yeah. giving him that range. But he grossed anywhere from twelve to fifteen million if you count the two thousand uh, dollar CD sets or eight hundred dollar books that were being sold, or the ten thousand dollar trips that were being sold. The point being is I went out for a break and I saw his the convoys of cars that were taking him. Uh, they were parked by the door, the, ex, the the side door, where no one else were, was. Security was supposed to be posted there. When they found me there, they kicked me out of the area, of course. And I took pictures of the cars. And in front, they were SUVs. You could see little white bands that were like police lights. I'm sure they you know, blinked red and blue, red and blue as they were driving. But there was a sticker and said, U.S. Dignitary had the federal logo, and it said, Department of Diplomatic Services uh, Division, or Diplomatic Security Division. So that's out of the DSS, I would assume, which is, was made famous by the Fast and Furious series, particularly Fast 5 through 7. I was blown away. What is Tony Robbins, who was a uh, uh, you know, you poor then, to, you know, being a U.S. dignitary. Now, let me tell you what I know from Colonel Michael Aquino. When we did an interview on his book, Mind War, if you control the five senses of people, you can control them and make them angry, like Hanoi Hilton, to sleep deprivation, feeding them stuff, and, you know, that's their own stuff, which is not to his yeah. sounds. Or positive. Uh, you know, he, look at Hitler. If he was a we lost seven fa family members due to his antics. Fifty million people lost their lives to, due to a, a greedy, greedy people. But the point was, is if he had the ability to have those minds do what he wanted, what can we do to get people to do to 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 break free of their chains and come forward? Tony Robbins used the very same techniques that. Aquino laid out in his book Mind War and Adolf Hitler used. The way Tony Robbins spoke was just like Hitler. He would stay on stage so everyone was quiet, start calm and soft, get everyone all riled up. He used mass hypnosis. The air was very cold. Uh, you had to go to outside to warm up. And on top of that, he, every word he wanted you to have plastered in your head was all over the walls. And there was lights and lasers, awesome music, and you were deprived of sleep. He demanded that you be there 8 in the morning. You were there till midnight. Now, I think that's a bad way to try to manipulate people, but what is there that we can do to tell everybody out there who is suffering through alien abduction or at least wants to be a part of the solution of getting this known, of having, like you said, a global you know, uh, UFO is a bad name, uh, maybe Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Day, or just an Extraterrestrial Day happen. What's it going to take? What would you do in your own hand if you were given all those powers, the Tony Robin powers, the uh, you know the mind work powers, and the money to get people to do this? Well, what I would try to do is educate people to be strong individuals. Too much of modern society, in my belief, people are more like sheep. They follow things. They follow religious doctrine, and they can't deviate from it. They follow what they're taught in schools, and they believe it 100%. I think you have to be a strong enough individual to stand on your own two feet and know that when you see something that goes contrary to your beliefs, that you've got to accept that you're intelligent, you're smart, you're strong, and you accept what you have just seen you can't have in your mind something can't be possible because i was taught it can't be possible that's what you have to do people have to be strong individually people in control in the government they expect us to be weak you are taught throughout school obey 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 you're marked down on a paper if you put something that is not going with the paradigm I've experienced it with my own three teenage sons and had to fight battles for them because they'll have an opinion different than a teacher, and the teacher would mark the paper down. You've got to be a strong person. Once you are and can stand on your own two feet, then that's 
when humans will evolve, and that's when we can move on to things like this. I agree. I hope it's just a matter of time. Like you said, in our lifetime, we will be, you know, strip fed this or hopefully just wholly fed what the truth really is. And we will get to meet our space brothers and sisters. Now, let me ask you, going back to Ellie, extinction mm-hmm. level events, can you talk about any that happened hundreds of millions of years ago and even billions of years ago? Because they say six Six of them happened going back to what was it, how many, 400 million years ago? I mean, can you right. just basically, lay, if you can, lay down the life of the Earth? Well, the Earth is at least four to five billion years old. We know that. Um, like you said, over the course of that, you have the, the six I've heard of those, one of them being 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were supposedly wiped out, and they're going back and forth on where that crater is. I think it's in the Gulf of Mexico, but there's differing opinions. It's just we have to realize we don't live in a safe place. This is a rock, a very small rock out in space. In our solar system alone, there are over 100 billion asteroids and comets. They're all in um, you know, past the fringes, you know, past where you have Pluto. Out in that area between there and Alpha Centauri, which they now see a relationship, and some scientists are even saying that is like a twin star to the sun with very weak influences on each other. There are literally just hundreds of billions of objects that in time come near to Earth and come through the solar system. In fact, on February the 5th, I believe it is, we will have a 180-meter asteroid pass within 4,000 miles of the Earth. It will be inside the 22,600-mile space where you have satellites. And it's 480 million years. Wow, that that would be... Now, we had... The Earth began four and a half billion years life ago. Then Mm -hmm. we had what light... The first signs of life, what was it... Uh, how, how many billion years ago? Was it half a, half a billion? Well, I, mean, was it- I don't agree with what modern science says on that. I agree with more with what Michael Cremo has yes. found. Yeah, that's right. He, t- he even talked about a five million year old uh, a, a human skeleton that was found in a cave in California. That's what he said right. in the last interview. And right, was- and, and I actually talked to him about that, and we may have um, eventually a show about that. But what we're going – he also found – him and his partner found evidence of modern human skeletons in layers of rock that were over 2 billion years old. And that's in his book, Forbidden History, and there's pictures of it. So uh, the Earth wasn't desolate for as many billions of years as mainstream science. So let's just say 2 billion years if Mm -hmm. if that's the case. So that leaves us with – Two out of 2.5 where it's desolate. But still, how many extinction-level events do you think we had in that period? Because mainstream history leads us to believe that the first one occurred just under 500 million years ago. I believe we've had literally hundreds and maybe thousands of them because of the comet swarms we go through. Now, when we say extinction-level event, I'm not saying every human will get killed. I'm not saying every species of animal but when you have a you know a winter that lasts on the earth for 10 years there are many yes. species that will not survive it well plant plant life can't survive if it has no, no sun yeah no actually um back in the 6th century when this happened in china they wrote that the chinese had the best historians and the best historical accounts back then they said the sun turned blue and it gave forth no heat and that was also echoed in other cultures around the world. And since it it lasted a good seven to ten years, depending on where you were at, plants died, livestock and animals died, people died and got very sick, the ones who were alive. There's actually some churches in Europe that have stained glass from back there during that period, and they showed the whole event through their stained glass windows. Wow. To where it was beautiful and warm, then suddenly it shows – an object coming down from the sky, sometimes a dragon instead of a comet, but it's the same principle. And then it shows desolation, and then it shows plants sprouting and growing again. 
this is an event that's happened over and over and over. It's just something that's going to continue happening. I believe it's happened thousands of times. We live in a world that is very dangerous. It is not just the safe, large planet, we think. If you look in relation to other things in the universe, we're just a tiny speck. And it's a very dangerous place to live when we have objects coming in from outer space. Well, and, and it's a very dangerous plus place where we are exactly. I, I want to ask you a few more questions okay. uh, before we begin. Uh, first of all, I, I want you to comment on this ISIS, ISIL stuff, which to me is a little bizarre that, first of all, Werner von Braun's speechwriter, uh, Carol Rosen, said that she, before he, Werner von Braun died, he said that they will be playing us different cards, uh, the cards to scare us, false flags. First, there would be the uh, terrorist, which we've already gone through. Then would be the comet's going to kill you. Then their final card they're going to play is the extraterrestrial invasion. Now, Greer proves otherwise by showing positive contact. And I have a few friends in Los Angeles, uh, one in Nevada who passed away, who were actually doing something along the lines of producing contact. But why is it, since 9-11, for over a decade, you turn on the news, you couldn't go a day without Al-Qaeda, 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 Al-Qaeda. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue, you're ISIS, ISIL. What are they doing? Is this just a scare propaganda technique? Or does this group really exist? Or did it evolve from Al-Qaeda and just change the name? Well, this group exists, but I believe originally it was a group that was funded by and given weapons by Western governments, probably the United States included, yes. to fight the regimes in Syria. And they wanted Syria out because that's Russia's foothold in the Middle East, and the Western world wanted to hold it. Now, I think that it has evolved from that. You see now a lot of the weapons they have are still Western weapons that they got. I think that we don't make the best choices as a government sometimes when we fund these terrorists. They turn into terrorist groups, these military groups, to promote our agenda in a country. But why could Russia go in there and start bombing them and have more success than the Western world had You know, in, in five years, Russia had in one week? There's a reason yes. for that. There has to be. I definitely agree with that. Uh, you know, looking out, if you were somebody who was looking into our universe, or our planet, in our life, you would be blown away just to see what we're doing to ourselves. I mean, I, just, I can't even imagine sometimes what a life who has evolved to a peaceful society. If we can't get along on this planet, then how would we get along with other species? And... Uh, what, one of the old researchers that died, he was a colonel, Wendell Stevens. He said that in his studies, he realized that Earth is a very popular place to visit and to have experience on. Why? Because of our environment allows for the largest, uh, I guess, types, the largest amount of life there is anywhere. So you can go to Earth and see more you know, fish and plants and, and four-legged creatures and flying creatures and so on and so forth than you can on any other planet. The problem is, by having so much life, I guess having to being so close to the, to the sun, I don't know his exact words. People would have to look up Wendell Stevens. But he did say that Earth is a great place for having a vast variety of life, but we die well before we're given wisdom. We don't develop wisdom until we get older. When we're younger, we're in that tough little mode. So would it be possible that if, say, uh, the average life of Homo sapien was 800 to 1,000 years, that we would be in a far more peaceful society than it is now where the average life is, what, 75, 80? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right about that. And I think in the past, we've had that longer lifespan. Uh, if you will, you know, your, yeah, ba your basic... Right. The Bible says it. Moses had it 800 years or something. And right. Another... And I researched some of that also. And 
you have longer lifespans with species, and they become much larger if your environment is more oxygen rich. And thousands and millions of years ago, the Earth was much more oxygen rich within the atmosphere. And I think that led to much longer lifespans and the giants that you see the skeletons of all over the world in different places. There's been hundreds of them dug up here in North America. Uh, if you go back to the Watcher series, they consider them Nephilim because they're looking yeah. at it from a biblical perspective. I believe they were just races of giants that were the humans for the longest time because there was more oxygen in the environment. They grew larger. Everything grew larger at that time. And then as the oxygen started depleting from our atmosphere, we got smaller as humans, and the giants eventually died out because of that. I, you mentioned oxygen. So are we on a path where oxygen is being depleted just like that movie Interstellar? Well, uh, it is in a way. There is a lot of human pollution. I do not buy the stuff about the climate change is being caused by humans because really the latest data, if you look at it from NASA, is the sun is about to go through its cold part of its cycle as the sunspots have hit their high and now they're going to go into decline. And when that happens, the average temperature on Earth can drop up to 10 degrees and ice ages start. And right now they're saying within the next 30 years, we could see the start of a mini ice age. I think things change on Earth in the atmosphere, but I believe it's more due to the sun and in the past volcanic eruptions and comet hits than anything people can do to it. So I think it's just a part of the natural evolution on Earth. Psych natural cycle. Mm -hmm. so I actually tend to, I think that makes more sense than anything else. Uh, although some people believe it's, it's not, but you, people fear change. But, you know, looking throughout history, like you said, we've had many ice ages as well as major ice ages. Now, a couple more questions for you here. NASA for in 1985, Richard Dolan uncovered an article from New York Times which said a multi-billion dollar military space program was canceled. The spin on the story was the economic damage to our country. To me, I was like, what? Wait a minute, what? We had a military space program and, and you're admitting to it? Then, during the citizen hearing in 2013, when I, Kevin Randall was testifying, Senator Gravel interrupted and said, we do have a space program a military or private space program, government funded that is running and is doing great. 2015, early 2015, I am watching uh, what we, you shouldn't be watching, mainstream media, ABC News it was, in fact. I remember because I even T-voted as soon as I saw this. And it's got breaking news. Space drone lands after, military space drone lands after two years in flight. And then it goes to show men in either nuclear suits or bio suits, whatever, going up to check on this little drone. I was blown away. Now, is NASA just a cover? Because look at what Gary McKinnon uncovered. Well, NASA is part of the Department of Defense. That much I have been told. In my position as an investigator, I have had former um, Department of Defense agents come up to me and talk to me. I've had former NSA people come to me. And Laura Eisenhower, again, getting back to her, she also told me of this secret space program, which she's known about for a long time. So it does exist, and we only see the things NASA wants us to see. It is most definitely a military operation, and I think it always has been. So if we're thinking that we're seeing everything when we have the shuttle up there or the International Space Station, if you look at their live feed, anytime something like a UFO shows up near it, suddenly the feed dies. Yes. Thank you for saying that. I've actually recorded that six times myself in the last 18 months. And and another thing is, is why is it during daylight it looks bright and just like a cable operator in Toronto or somewhere in Canada found – that they seem to switch on at night because we could see clear and deeper into space. But you're absolutely right. Images show up on the uh, on the space station ISS, 
And boom, Nata cuts the feet off to people. How many times can he use the same excuse? And GoPro sent a camera up there. I have beautiful images of an astronaut in a suit taking a space walk. What's behind him? A blue object. Yeah, well, it's like Clifford Stone said recently. Um, He said, look, back in the 1960s, he said, when I first joined the armed forces, and then, the, you know, he's the one that was on the crash retrieval teams and was an intermediary between aliens and the American government. He yeah, said, he was the telepath or something like that, right? Yeah, he said, they showed me cameras that were up in space 22,000 miles that could zoom in on a license plate in a city on Earth, on a city street, and you could read the license plate. That's right. I heard they could the SR seventy one back in the sixties mm-hmm. had a camera good enough to read the time on your wristwatch. Right. Others claim that they even have the capability to read the print on your newspaper. So you could be reading a letter and boom, it's in uh you know, the right. old hands. And <laughs> and here's the scary part, metadata. Uh, what is going on with this NSA stuff? Uh, you know, Hoden, Snowden, I'm, I'm yeah. hoping to hook uh, an interview with him. I have three lawyers, and we've all, what we're doing is sent, we sent a letter on firm letterhead asking his attorney to pass on a letter to him, offering him pro bono defense if he should ever come back to face trial. But between you and me, who's going to come back to face trial? When an oh. attorney general says to you, uh, come back and plead guilty. We'll work this out. We'll give you life without parole and supermax. We'll take the death penalty off the table. Yeah, sure. Let me leave my beautiful pole dancing girlfriend mm. and my high paying job in Russia so I can run back to be uh, in in ADX Supermax in Florence, Colorado, where uh, my girlfriend and my dreams will never see me again. I, it's just the stupidest idea in the world. Oh yeah. But he he also exposed that at any given time there are over 1.2 million people being watched. That is a humongous number. Now a lot of people think that there's a million point five people sitting behind computers. That's not true. By the time me and you have had this conversation, everything that has been said has been transcribed, typed, cross-checked with our emails, phone calls, text messages, those of our friends, and beyond to see if we're some sort of threat. Uh, The metadata, uh, such as what came from MH370 with one of the passengers who took a picture in his pocket, texted to his girlfriend, when they saw just the black image, which allegedly was, you know, in a pocket where nothing was to be seen, tracked the data to the coordinates where Diego Garcia is, our largest military drone right. system. Mm-hmm. So when you have all these little things that can a- attach to each other, uh, I think George Orville, is that his name, Orville, right. 1984? He had a better thought of what a corrupt world would be than what we're in. Well, exactly. I, that book was a warning, not a guide. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, the reason okay. I brought up um, Clifford Stone on it, his comment really struck me. He said, if I could read a license plate from space in the 1960s, how come you can't see clearly everything on Mars? He said, we have the camera. That's right. That's right. That is absolutely right. Or Mars or beyond even, yes. know, I would think, you know, or beyond. And I think slowly things are finally coming to be shown. And like you said, it seems like NASA is finally acclimating us. Now, let me ask you another thing here. Uh, aside, aside from Clifford Stone, two, two more topics I want to talk about. Mm-hmm. What do you think about Bob Lazar and him saying that we've had – We've been externally corrected 63 times to become what we are today, and we're undergoing our 64th correction to become homo nuaticus. Well, I I don't know about the the number of times that's happened, but I fully believe, based on what I've read and the research that's out there, that the human genome has been manipulated in the past. And I believe it's still going on, and that could very well be what the hybrid agenda is. I mean, I believe modern humans were very much manipulated by an alien race 
to become the modern humans we are today. And there are parts of our DNA which the researchers looking at it say, we don't understand why this is here unless it was manipulated. That's the only reason it should be in our DNA. And I'm sure it's still going on today. I mean, look at what they call the um, indigo children, you know, that, yes. that have explain the… That, explain that to everybody. Well, indigo children are, are the certain ones who seem to have a higher level of telepathy, very, very intelligent, very, very bright children. And you can look this up for yourself on the Internet and see about it. But if you've got one of these indigo children, they're very empathic. Um, they, they can feel what other people are feeling. They seem to be the next step in human evolution. And I believe that probably is genetically modified, and I have talked to abductees who have had what they call indigo children. That would make sense, and uh, obviously I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, first of all, we have man playing God by manipulating him, uh, you know, beings on this earth, uh, whether it being dogs, you know, there was that famous video from the Soviets in the 50s where they showed that the dog could live without a head or the head being somewhere separate. I, it was a weird experiment. You'd have to look it up. But the movie Jurassic Park makes me beg to, one, beg to wonder and think, does a billionaire out there somewhere uh, have a little island with pet T-Rexes and, and bronchiosauruses or and, pterodactyls and all the other stuff from different periods, by the way. That's one thing Jurassic Park got off, was very wrong. I think I don't think all those dinosaurs lived in that same per period. Uh, you know, at least uh, that's what I've read from mainstream history. But do you think it's possible that that that's even true, that, that could even happen? Because Dr. Lear believes believed before he passed away that he's sure a Jurassic Park type uh, place is somewhere for fun or experimentation on this planet. Well, I believe so. The Chinese right now have a very advanced cloning program. And I fully believe that you can, if you can get the DNA, which I'll tell you how easy it is to get the DNA. One of my sons loves biology and wants to become a marine biologist eventually. And yeah, I won't let him hear this radio broadcast until after Christmas, but it's very easy to go on eBay and get amber with different insects in it. And like they did in Jurassic Park, you had a mosquito that had dinosaur blood in it. You can get this literally for under $30 insects yes. in amber. So that DNA is there, and it is preserved. And since we have the cloning technology, remember Dolly the sheep, there's mm -hmm. been dogs, Cloned. There's been um, bison cloned. They just brought back a plant. And, and I thought they brought back a thigh bone from a Homo erectus or Neanderthal. Yeah. One of the uh, Neanderthal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, so you're right. You're absolutely right. It is insanely crazy. Uh, stem cells are the old times. We don't even need that now. It's just a drop of DNA, which doesn't necessarily mean it has to be from a giant pool of a drop of blood. So for instance, you prick your 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 hand and a drop of blood comes out. That's a giant pool for you to choose for DNA testing. You you yeah. can create and make lots of things. Here's the final topic I want to get to before I want you to plug in your books. My favorite topic within ufology is crash and retrieval. What can you tell me about that? What crashes outside of Roswell? Do you know about because obviously Roswell for everybody out there who still thinks it's hokey pokey just remember the government the government the people who put their hands on it tested it gave uh, uh, their message or, or had a statement to be read to world to the world and in it they said we have in our possession a, a flying saucer a crash flying saucer with bodies the story was later redacted. But why would they have said that story from the beginning? If they were so saying it was some sort of spy satellite, of course they wouldn't say spying on the Russians if it was you know, the, the height of the Cold War. But you could make up any other story than crashed flying saucer. You know what kind of crap storm that's going to cause by saying so. So aside from Roswell, what crash and retrievals do you know of? And if you want to comment on Roswell, go ahead. Well... 
Um, Roswell, I'll say first. Um, I know since I was in MUFON, I'm not in MUFON any longer. I left to be with Zero, with the Close Encounters Research Organization. But they fully believed that MUFON, that Roswell had already been explained. But I actually talked to some people who are friends with the Marcel family, and yes. that, I believe, was really a crash. That was really a UFO crash. There's too much evidence there. There was over a dozen deathbed confessions by people involved with it stating it was true. In American legal system, a deathbed confession is accepted as fact. That's so, right. I believe it's, it's that fully. Right. It's a, it, why would someone lie right as they die? Wouldn't that be the time to clear your conscience? Yeah, it would be. Now, I can tell you of the one other case I know. Clifford Stone talks about many retrievals he was on. But there was one that, as I was researching when I was with MUFON, uh, the Battle of Los Angeles, which I'm sure you're very familiar Great. with. Yeah, yes. Okay, there were more than one ship seen that night. There were at least three seen. And two of them were shot down. Yeah, I was just going to say, didn't one end up in the San Bernardino Mountains, the other one in the Pacific Ocean off Santa Monica? Right. They didn't ever recover the one in the ocean. But some people from the military did come forward, and they did recover the one from the San Bernardino Mountain area. And actually, what is not known on it publicly that much is that there was something – these people – the the um, the aliens inside were dead. The retrieval team, they were not in safe suits. And there were three American military fatalities when they wow. tried to extract them from that ship. So, Just like Dr. Bo- Bob Wood said when I interviewed him on alien pathogens. Exactly. Exactly. And Dr. Bob Wood is the one who told me about that. Uh, very interesting. Pete, we can go on so much more. It's been a fascinating time. We will absolutely speak again. Everybody out there, make sure you get The Flaming Dragon by Pete Elmore and his wife, Barbara. And don't forget the one that's creating stirs of, of happiness, craziness, whatever you want to call it. But it is real, and it will scare you to death by reading it uh, because it's true. It's called Reflections of an Alien Investigator. Pete, thanks again for joining us, and I would like to give you the opportunity to tell everyone what you're going to be doing soon, any other other books, where they can find them, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, all my books are on Amazon. There's actually three of them, the two we've discussed tonight, plus also uh, just a, a fun little one I wrote about the paranormal investigations I did called um, – 13 Easy Ways to Determine if Your House is Haunted, which is just a fun little e-book you can get there. I've just completed a book that is um, it's a fictional novel, which uses all of the aliens, which are basically um, people are experiencing and the abductees know of. I wrote a novel about that, and it's going to be finished soon, and it's going to be called The Alliance, and it'll probably be available in about a month. Also, The Flaming Dragon uh, is at Fleur de Lis Studios in development. They believe it could possibly be a TV series like Game of Thrones. So we're very hopeful that in the near future we may have an announcement about that book being turned into a TV series. So we're constantly working and constantly working with Ciro International. Um, we're going to have um, some meetings coming up hopefully in the spring, and we'll get more information out about that. It's a great organization. If you do feel like you've been abducted, you should definitely get in contact with Yvonne Smith, and the help and support you need is there. It's a great organization. Agreed. Ciro International, C-E-R-O International.com for everybody out there. Uh, Let me just throw in some plugs. Of course, if you've seen the YouTube channel, you'll see some awesome interviews, people ranging from celebrity Jack Osborne. Why? People say he doesn't know much, but he does actually has an experience. He does have stories, and he's working on a mainstream documentary and is very well interested in the subject. Uh, Duck Curls from the famous rock band Hollywood Undead was on by himself, where uh, aside from all the phone calls from the young lady saying they loved him, we actually had some real questions, and then he came back as a guest co-host 
with the one and only Jim Mars. That will be up soon, too, if it's not already by this point. Don't forget, Robert Morningstar is up there. So is Nick Redfern, former BBC reporter Tony Gosling, who talks about 9-11, uh, Hitler having uh, being funded by both sides, uh, the, the war being funded by both sides, Hitler being funded by the Union Bank run by Prescott Bush, George W. Bush's grandfather, Herbert Walker Bush's father, and also a member of the Skull and Bones. Also, you will see Eric Von Donegan, Foster Gamble, Nassim Harriman, who talks about manipulating gravity. These people are all going to be re- coming back. I just spoke to Paul Hellier uh, two days ago, in fact, and he will be here in a uh, uh, early January for everybody out there who is interested. He's the former defense minister of Canada, one of the most credible people ever. More interviews from Apollo 14 astronauts, six men on the moon, which was the third mission to the moon. Successful one at that. Apollo 13 was going to be it, but never happened, never made it there. And also Eric Von Donegan, if I said that he'll be, he, the videos of, of him is already up uh, the last two and there's two more to go, and another fresh interview with him, and so much more. All you have to do is go to drjradiolive.com, drjradiolive.com. That is the same name for all social media accounts. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google+, even uh, my Gmail, uh, you know, everything. There's eight accounts, at least nine, I think, even Pinterest, that are all under the same name, DRJ Radio Live, Dr. J Radio Live. So if you send out a tweet, just tag me. And if it's cool enough, I will retweet it to my followers. Again, this is Dr. J. If you want to be part of the live shows or just listen to awesome shows like this, just go to the website, drjradiolive.com. I am signing off. <laughs>